that those who believe in certain philosophies, those who believe that some things ought to be that are not. I remember one of the poets saying that some people see things and ask why, but I dream of things that have never been and ask why not. And so we keep asking why not? Why are there so many instances where people don't experience what most of us would describe as justice and due process, even though it is written in our Constitution that that's <coughs> what they ought to experience or that's what they ought to expect? I think my years of being engaged in public policy making and trying to make laws and all of that causes me to interpret our Constitution <coughs> a certain way. And I would say that the one thing that our Constitution guarantees is the right to struggle. And if we struggle, then all of the protections that we think are inherent become real. A fellow named Frederick Douglass said something that I subscribe to a great deal. He said that struggle, struggle, strife, and pain are the prerequisites for change. If there is no struggle, then there is no progress. He said that the struggle may be a moral one, it may be a physical one, but there must be struggle. And that's one of the reasons that we are introducing the Law Enforcement Torture Prevention Act of 2012. It is designed to address what has been revealed as a void in our body of law. The original drafting and introduction of this bill was a direct response to the actions of former police commander John Burge and the inability of our judiciary to prosecute him commensurate with those actions. From 1972 to 1991, over 110 African American men and women were tortured by Burge and detectives under his command at areas two and three police headquarters in Chicago with the intention of extracting confessions. The techniques used, such as annually raping men with cattle prods, were arguably more sadistic than the waterboarding of suspected terrorists, which has garnered so much attention and scrutiny in recent years. Although everyone may not agree that torture should not be used in the interrogation of alleged terrorists, those of us that do ought to be equally concerned with the torture of American citizens for similar purposes or for any reason at all. In the Burge case, the U.S. Attorney was unable to prosecute Burge for anything more than perjury and obstruction of justice because of the short statute of limitations on the other possible charges. Furthermore, while there are federal laws that criminalize acts of torture that occur within the United States, none of those statutes prescribe acts of torture as an actual crime of torture. The bill we are talking about addresses both of those things. One, it eliminates any statute of limitation and it properly identifies acts of torture perpetrated by anyone acting under the color of law as a crime. Agents of law enforcement in this country have a critical responsibility within the fabric of society and towards that end, they're given a tremendous amount of power and discretion, which gives the nature of their business as being necessary for them to carry out the duties with which they have been charged. 
I believe that the majority of them carry out their duties honorably, but we cannot ignore the fact that some of them do not. And those that do not have to be held accountable. The sadistic abuse of power that we will be confronted here today simply cannot be tolerated. It cannot be tolerated because it damages, if not destroys, the credibility of the law enforcement institution as a whole, and thus the relationship of that institution to the citizenry. Furthermore, it cannot be tolerated because those who find themselves in the custody of these agents are extremely vulnerable. In fact, the only thing that separates someone in custody from the abuse of a custodian is that custodian's integrity. And when that integrity is breached, the result is not only an assault on the individual, but an assault on our society and our values. People who have been arrested have a constitutional right to due process. And similarly, those who have been convicted have a constitutional right to be free from cruel and unusual punishment. It was the people of this nation that demanded that the Bill of Rights be created. And had that not been done, the Constitution would not have been ratified. In other words, the Bill of Rights is a covenant that the government made with the people a promise that fundamental civil liberties would not be violated. To the degree that this covenant was a prerequisite to the ratification of the Constitution and formation of the United States, the protection of it is necessary to maintain the stability of the nation and the viability of our fundamental values. We have this afternoon with us. Individuals who've had direct experience, individuals who have represented torture victims, individuals who themselves have experienced torture. We call this the jump off of the reintroduction of our bill that if one individual is saved from the inhumanity, the inhumane treatment of torture, then we would consider our effort as having been worthwhile. To kick off our discussion and testimony, we have two individuals seated at the table. Attorney Frank Taylor of the People's Law Office. And we will also have comments from Daryl Hammond, who is a torture survivor. Flint will discuss the importance of the bill in general, with the Burge case as a particular example, and also speak from the perspective of a litigator who represented torture survivors. And Darrell, of course, will be recounting his own experience with John Burge. We also had Ms. Bridget Keller from the National Police Accountability Project and the National Lawyers Guild. She will present examples from around the country to show that law enforcement torture is a national problem and that the Burge case was not an isolated incident. And so we will thank both of them for being with us. And Flint, we will start with you. Thank you very much. Thank you all very much for coming. Um, I want to thank particularly uh, Congressman Davis, who is and has been for as long as I have been in Chicago, which is over 40 years, one of those tremendous agents of change. And sometimes he brings a full um, hay wagon and sometimes he doesn't, but he always comes. And he always comes and shows the leadership in Chicago, particularly on issues such as this, on issues of police torture, police brutality, uh, prison uh, injustices, 
uh, injustices in the criminal justice system. So we in Chicago, who have been fighting these Burge cases for well nigh 20 some, 28, 29 years, uh, thanks so much uh, for Danny Davis, the uh, great congressman from the west side of Chicago, doing here what he's done in Chicago for these many years. The name John Burge in Chicago is synonymous with torture. The name John Burge in Chicago is synonymous with confessions that were tar tortured wrongfully from black <coughs> suspects over a 20 year period in the city of Chicago, sending many of them not only to the penitentiary but to death row, where many of them spent decades, decades, some of them still in the penitentiary. This bill has several very important aspects to it. But before I get to it, let me tell you what we mean in Chicago when we use the term torture. Danny made a reference to it. We were talking and are talking about electric shock. Not only with cattle prods, but with a device that was brought back from Vietnam by John Burge. And it was in a black box such as this. And I couldn't bring the black box on the airplane, but this is the best I could do. If you look closely, and I have a couple of pictures of it, and we can certainly, people can look at it more closely later, uh, it has a generator in it, what was used in Vietnam to, to, for telephones, uh, which you, and a crank, which you can see in this one on the side. And if you turn the crank, the generator emits electricity. He then had wires attached to the box, to the generator, and then in this picture you can see he had uh, alligator clips on the wires. So what he would do was he'd take the men uh, when they wouldn't confess, and he'd put those clips on their ears, on their fingers, on their chest, on their genitals, <coughs> and crank the box. Oftentimes he would put some kind of bag over their head. In those days they had typewriters in the detective station houses. And the typewriters had bags or covers similar to this. And what he would do, they would do, I shouldn't limit it to Burge, he had many men working under his command who followed his orders, and Daryl Cannon will talk about two of his, uh, his chief lieutenants and right hand men in a moment. But he'd take this bag and he'd put it over the head of the suspect pull it tight around the neck so that there's no air and then hold it there for several minutes oftentimes punching or kicking the person in the chest area to knock whatever air he had in his lungs out to make sure he felt like he was suffocating much like uh, what they call uh, submarino or waterboarding except this is dry submarino not the waterboarding type where you think you're drowning, but you nonetheless think that you're suffocating and have no air. And they were just before they figured that they, the man might expire, or after he passed out, they'd take the bag off of his head. Those were two of the main kinds of torture that was repeatedly used by Burge and lieutenants named Byrne, Dignan, and others. So that's the kind of torture that for many years was countenanced in the city of Chicago. It was well known in this station house. It was well known to the superintendents and the command personnel in the city of Chicago. And it was well known to the state's attorney of Cook County, whose name shall not be spoken here, but it begins with D and ends with Y. And he later went on to be the mayor of the city of Chicago as his father had been. He was specifically told about this torture in 1982. And we stand here today needing such a torture statute because that state's attorney, very powerful man, decided to ignore that evidence of torture. He decided to ignore evidence that doctors brought to him of the torture, physical pictures of that torture, and decided not to investigate or prosecute John Burge. As a result, more than 75 additional men were tortured in the next seven years while Richard Daly was, uh, was, the, was the state's attorney of Cook County. 
And one of them was Daryl Cannon, who will speak to you in a moment. He didn't prosecute. The U.S. Attorney at that time didn't prosecute. No matter how lar loudly we and the community uh, registered its outrage, there were no prosecutions. So many, many years later, as, as Congressman Dave Davis referred, uh, there was an honest U.S. Attorney uh, who decided to investigate this and decided that he would use uh, perjury and obstruction of justice because these men in lawsuits we brought uh, took um, lied about whether they tortured people. So he took those lies under oath and prosecuted Burge for obstruction of justice. Burge is now in pen the penitentiary for four and a half years, which was the most that he could be sentenced for all these horrendous crimes. <laughs> so Congressman Davis and we and members of the community said, this is not right. It's time to recognize torture in federal law for the crime against humanity that it is. Like genocide and slavery, torture is outlawed under the International Conventions Against Torture, uh, and it in fact is treated as a crime internationally without a statute of limitations. If there were no statute of limitations in uh, federal law at this point, Burge and his men could have been and could be prosecuted for the crimes that they committed, and could be sentenced for the serious nature of those crimes. Unfortunately, that did not and cannot happen. So this bill reintroduced in this Congress, and as Congressman Davis said, as an agent of change, it may not get passed and be passed at this session, but it will keep coming back, and it will still be on the conscience of the collective Congress until it is passed. And it does two very important things. Not only does it define torture and make torture a crime in this country when law enforcement officers commit it, but it also does away with a statute of limitations. For, so for those reasons alone, this bill is very important. But it is also extremely important not only in what it does, but in symbolically in what it says. Because torture in this country cannot be countenanced. It cannot be on the conscience of this country. Torture cannot be. Daryl Cannon uh, is a client of mine, uh, one of many <coughs> torture survivors who I have and my fellow lawyers have represented in the past and continue to represent over the past 25 years. We're hopeful uh, that we will be able to have him speak to you via Skype from Chicago. I also brought several copies of a DVD that's 15 minutes long in which he tells of his torture in detail, in powerful detail. DVD, the interview was done by my daughter who's here today. Um, and it also uh, interviews another torture victim, Anthony Holmes, who was the first torture victim. Uh, and it's, uh, if people would like to have a DVD of it, as many as they can, uh, are here, and there are also three very powerful DVDs, including that one on YouTube, uh, which you can watch. Uh, and I can give you the YouTube citations. Uh, are we ready to uh, roll with Daryl? No, just give us a few minutes. All right, well, uh, let's see, I have to work on my stand up routine. No, <laughs> just, um, I've certainly spoken on this topic many times and uh, many different lengths of time. Uh, it, it's a very serious topic. Um, you know, the code of silence is such an important aspect of this case. Even though it was well known that the torture was going on for many years in the station houses and in the state's attorney's office and in the high levels of the of police department, no one would come forward. The way that we found out that this was more than an isolated incident of one extreme torture case was through anonymous letters that I received from a police officer who worked with Burge, who was so terrified by the idea that he would be identified for coming forward against the torturers that he sent these letters anonymously. But what he did was let us know 
that there were other victims of torture and let us know who the names of the other torturers were. And based on that, we were able to unpeel the onion over the last 20 years that led to naming and documenting over 110 cases of police torture. All African American men, save one African American woman. So the code of silence has been extremely powerful in these cases, and it's one of the other reasons why uh, the, the fact of no statute of limitations is so important. Because cover up in the law enforcement and in the military is so powerful because the police have the gun and they have the ability not only to ostracize you, but to put a bullet in your back if you're uh, enforcing the law. That in fact, uh, the statute oftentimes is necessary because they'll be able to cover up the torture for many years and officers won't come forward until they retire, if they come forward at all. We okay now? Mm -hmm. Great. So, um, without further ado, uh, this is Daryl Cannon, um, who uh, was tortured in 1983, uh, spent 24 years in the penitentiary for a tortured confession. He was finally released in 2007, and he has a very eloquent story, a powerful story to tell you all about how he was tortured by two of Burge's uh, right-hand men uh, in, in a, well, I'll let him go on. And he asked me then, nigga, you want to tell us everything you want to know? 
And at that point, I told him I didn't have anything to tell them about anything. His other two detectives, uh, Peter, uh, John Burns and Runhard, told him to go ahead, blow that nigga's head off. And they attempted to force a <laughs> shotgun barrel in my mouth. I didn't voluntarily open my mouth, and as a result from that, they split my upper lip and chipped my two teeth to the shotgun barrel in my mouth. And once they got the shotgun barrel in my mouth, they asked me the questions again. <coughs> Was I the one to tell them what I knew about the crime? And I told them no. And at that point, Peter Dick pulled the trigger on the shotgun. Then he took the shotgun barrel out of my mouth. He went in his pocket and pulled the shell back out and told me, nigga, listen. <coughs> they repeated that three separate times. Now, the third time that I heard the click from the shotgun to show you how the mind is, in my mind, I honestly thought they blew the back of my head off. But they didn't stop there. They tried to hang me uh, by my handcuffs that was cuffed behind my back. Uh, they wasn't successful in that because of the fact that uh, it was raining that morning out there and the detective couldn't keep his footing on the back seat, on the back bumper of the detective car. They then redid my handcuffs that was in front of me and they made me lay down in the back seat of the detective car. They pulled my pants and my shorts down and the detective took out a cattle prop and turned it on and proceeded to shock me electric shot me on my testicles and my genitals with this electric cattle prod. Uh, the pain was so excruciating that I tried to kick the cattle prod out of one of the detective's hands and I was successful in doing so. And in doing so, uh, the back of the, uh, the cattle prod popped open and the batteries came out. They put the batteries back in and proceeded to do this again <coughs> again and again. They shot me, it seemed like it was forever that they shot me with this electric cattle prop and in the process of doing so, they told me what they knew about the crime. It got to the point where after a while, I could not take being shot anymore. And I agreed <coughs> to tell them that my mother did, if that's what they wanted me to do. Anything to stop the electric shocks, even though my mother never committed a crime in her life. But this is how barbaric they were, and it wasn't a job that they was doing. You know, you can look at someone and tell when they don't really want to do what they're doing. But these three detectives loved what they were doing. They had the look of joy on their faces all while they tortured me <coughs> up under the color of law. And that, that's the thing that I can't uh, get away from the fact that this was did under the color of law. And they were able to go into court and raise their right hand and swear to tell the truth. And did so and said that they never did anything wrong to me whatsoever. Yet and still, after two new trials, no evidence presented against me, no witnesses, no nothing except the alleged torture confession. <laughs> Finally, uh, the state's attorney's office decided to drop all charges against me and to release me. After doing 24 years, my last nine years, those 24 years were did in supermax penitentiary <laughs> where you had no contact with anyone. <laughs> so the system continued to try and torture me the very best that they could, but I'm thankful to God that the spirit of my mother and my grandmother reside within me and made me stubborn enough not to give up and to persevere regardless of what. And I'm here today to say that this bill needs to be passed. It needs to be passed to protect those of the future. They can't protect people like me, Anthony Holmes, and others because what was done to us was dear to us. Dr. King once said that out of everywhere he's ever been in the South, he didn't experience racism as worse as he did until he came to Chicago. I didn't understand it then, 
when he first made that statement, but after November the 2nd, 1983, I clearly understood what he meant by that because unlike the South or anywhere else, Chicago was the most voracious city in the city of Chicago, <laughs> in the country for that matter, especially when it came down to torture. When I first was alleged about torture, no one wanted to believe that three detectives would stoop so low to be so barbaric. You know, but now uh, it's no longer a shock. Now it is the truth. Uh, people like Danny Davis has taken the courage to stand up and to speak on it uh, when in the past it hasn't been politically correct to do so. I'm thankful to him. I'm thankful to my lawyers. I'm thankful to all the, all the committees that continue to fight this battle dealing with police brutality. And I hope and pray that today we will learn some vital lessons again from the past and we will not be doing it <coughs> in the future. This bill is crucial in being passed. There should be no delay. Torture exists in Philadelphia. Torture exists in New York. Torture exists in Rampart, California. You know, so it's not just Chicago, but Chicago is taking the lead role in trying to set in place laws that will stop this and laws that will say that ain't no such thing as statute of limitations of torturing a person. They can't bring me back to the 24 years that I did. When I was in prison, I lost my mother, my father, my son. I lost a lot of loved ones that I cannot get back. So I'm saying to this committee today, Please do not play games. Do not delay. Do what is necessary to pass this bill to see to it. See to it that a measure of justice is in fact rendered in the situation. Please, and please know that. Don't be sorry to bear on you know, because the tears I shed is, is pure hatred. Pure hatred. I kid you not. Pure hatred. And I know my lawyers don't like me to speak like that. <laughs> but, you know, uh, I, I have to tell you the truth. You know, I can't tell you that I can forgive. I can never forget. I can never forgive. I can never forget. You know, only God can do that. Only thing I can do is tell you how I feel and I hope and pray that something will be done soon about this because there's a lot of girl candidates uh, who have been victimized beyond the shadow of a doubt. And at some point in time, justice needs to prevail. Uh, Dr. King went a long time before he got a measure of justice. He gave his life. Uh, in order for us to, to be where we are today. So Daryl Cannon is saying, and those on behalf of Daryl Cannon who have experienced this and who have not been able to speak, I speak to them and saying that torture is never right. I don't care what the occasion is, torture is never right. Let justice prevail, and I thank you for your attention, and I'm sorry that I got kind of emotional like I do, but this is a subject that affects me personally in more ways than one. So because of that, uh, you see what you see. Uh, as simple as that. Hopefully all of you will push. And Congressman Davis, uh, I'm so thankful that you got the backbone that you have uh, in, in leading this fight here. And my attorney, Fletch Hill, people in law office, and other committees, um, we would never be at this junction if it hadn't been for you and all the hard work you continue to do, the threats that you've had to endure. So please, committee, know that this is a human problem. This is a problem that the same way you deal with other countries and wanting to help them, then let's help us. Let's help us at home. Let's be the lead and say that, hey, look, we're taking steps right now to clean our house and to do what is necessary to ensure that no more torture. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Daryl. Um, you have a strong constitution. I can tell you that there are people not only in America, but there are people all over the world who thank you for raising the spectrum, for having the strength and courage that you have displayed. We know that you may never personally receive the justice that you deserve, <coughs> but there are those of us who will try to do everything in our power to make sure that other people do not have to have the same experiences that you've had. Thank you again so very much, and I certainly share the accolades that you have given to Flint and all of those at the People's Law Office for the many years of continuous hard-nosed digging that they have done. They have stood the course and will continue the fight. And thank you so very much. And um, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity uh, to speak in support of the Law Enforcement Torture Prevention Act of 2012. I would like to begin my remarks with a quote from Sister Diana Ortiz. She's a torture, uh, torture survivor and an outspoken critic of American involvement in torture domestically and abroad. She said, one never heals from torture. One merrily learns to cope with the aftermath. The importance of the proposed legislation cannot be overemphasized. The National Police Accountability Project is supporting the bill because torture is one of the most heinous crimes that traumatizes individual victims for the rest of their lives. And make no mistakes, it also traumatizes the entire community. Torture is antithetical to even the most basic notion of justice and often leads to wrongful convictions based on coerced confessions like in Daryl's case. Torture as a human rights violation by state actors <coughs> undermines the principles of democracy and the rule of law. During my tenure as the executive director of the National Police Accountability Project, I have encountered the entire panoply of uh, law enforcement misconduct, including conduct that I would have deemed inconceivable only a few years ago. Unfortunately, acts of torture are part and parcel of this conduct. Torture in police custody is not limited to a few rogue police officers at Area 2 in Chicago. Acts of torture committed by law enforcement officers, including in jails and prisons, is a systemic and persistent problem. Too many people in this country have suffered torture at the hand of those who are supposed to protect and uphold the law. Daryl has talked to us about the worst forms of torture. Torturous conduct or conduct can be tortured long before it takes those extreme forms. And some of the cases I will, um, um, will introduce to you or reference uh, are, are cases where the torture was psychological. But I find it really important to understand that psychological, tor psychological torture has to be considered torture as well. So let me tell you... <laughs> Can you, can you hear me well? So should I try to go no. with that? No, maybe with some more. Oh, okay. <coughs> okay. So let me introduce you to a couple of cases. Abdallah Higasi, New York. Shortly after September 11th, Abdallah Higasi was arrested and taken into FBI custody after a two-way radio was found in a hotel room 
near the World Bank Trade Center, where he stayed. Higas was held for a month and subjected to several interrogations. After initially denying ownership, Higazi broke down and confessed. He said that he felt cons confessing was his best option, considering the agent's use of coercion, threats, and intimidation. During the interrogations, FBI agents repeatedly banged on the table, screamed at him, and threatened his family. Higazi testified that the agent was so enraged that his face turned red and he feared that the agent would hit him. Higazi was only released from custody when the actual owner of the device, an airline pilot, claimed his property. Diana Bond. Di Diane Bond is another Chicago case. It's not um, a, a case uh, uh, that where John Birch and his crew was were the perpetrator. It's a case that happened much later, and I believe that it's a case that actually proves why we really need this act, because the officers that tortured Diane Bond did it from April 2003 and March 2004. They did it, they continued to do it, even though she filed two complaints with internal affairs. And as Chicago police officers, of course, they knew nothing would happen to them. So from April 2003 to March 2004, a small group of Chicago police officers who had previously engaged in a pattern of abuse of public housing residents on the south side of Chicago committed repeated serious human rights abuses on Diane Bond. The officers sexually abused Ms. Bond on multiple occasions, threatened to plant drugs on her and arrest her on fal false charges. They used racial and gender-based slurs and threatened her with needle-nosed pliers and a screwdriver, shattering her sense of security and leaving her convinced that they eventually would kill or rape her. The group of officers beat and choked Diane Bond. They beat her son and coerced him into beating another member of the community, forcing her to watch the abuse. At no time did the officers have any legal, legal justification to search or seize her person, her home or her belongings, nor did they ever have an, an arrest warrant for Ms. Bond or anybody <coughs> else in her household. Another case of torture are the San Francisco Eight. In 1973, John Bowman, Harold Taylor, and Ruby Scott were tortured by the New Orleans Police Department with the assistance of two San Francisco detectives. Over days, they were stripped, blindfolded, beaten, and covered in blankets <coughs> that were soaked in boiling water. And electrical prods were used on their genitals. They confessed to various crimes, among them the death of, of a San Francisco police officer. In 1974, the evidence was found <coughs> inadmissible because it had been obtained through torture, <coughs> and the charges were dismissed. <coughs> However, the perpetrators of the crime of the torture had never been criminally charged or disciplined. Instead, the two former San Francisco officers later served <coughs> as agents with the Anti-Terrorist Task Force of the Federal Prosecutor's Office at the Department of Homeland Security. <coughs> Another case um, concerns the uh, Ventura County Sher Sheriff's Department in California. Court von Kalm, Keith Stringer, Eric Pratt, and Jeffrey Lloyd were arrested and detained by the Ventura County Sheriff's Department at different times and put in prostrained chairs. It's a plastic chair with leg irons, handcuffs, and various straps. And I will only read um, the facts of one of the cases um, to you because they're all fairly similar. Kurt von Kong was arrested after he accidentally fell off his bike. He was stripped naked and put in the, re in the restraint chair 
when he inquired what he was detained for. Restraints were placed around his wrists and ankles, and he was denied access to a bathroom. He defecated and urinated on himself twice. He was left in this condition for over five hours. When he pleaded to be released, the shackles on his ankles were further tightened, leading to a fractured ankle. Eventually, he was wheeled into a bathroom and made to clean up his own waist with his bare hands. Jerry Lloyd has a, his has a history of mental illness. Lloyd's concerned family called for assistant, assistance because of his depression and suicidal behavior. When the police arrived, Lloyd was pepper sprayed and then brought to Ventura County Jail, where he was immediately put in the restraint chair. He too was denied access to the bathroom. Even though the pe pepper spray further exacerbated his depressed state, he, has never seen, he was never seen by a physician. Neither of the men was violent or combative before being put in the chair. During the time of these particular incidents, from May 1996 to December 1997, the chair was used 377 times. And according to the sheriff's own records, people were restrained for not cooperating, banging on walls, not following commands, which suggests that the device was used, was used solely for punitive reasons. Especially egregious are cases involving children and juveniles. And let me tell you, there are many. And uh, children are more vulnerable to the effects of torture. They are in the critical stages of physical and psychological development where they may suffer great, graver consequences than similarly ill-treated adults. This seemingly self-evident statement does not prevent law enforcement personnel to treat children and juveniles with unbelievable cruelty. Consider these cases. Na Truong, Massachusetts. Na Truong spent two years and eight months in prison after confessing to smothering her 13-month-old son, Kyle. It is 2008, and Na is 16 years old, when two Worcester police officers interrogate her for over two hours, the day, only one day, after her son had died. The cruel pattern of lies, threats, and deceptions, which can only be described as psychological torture, finally breaks the teenager, who is described by the judge as a frightened, meek, emotionally compromised teenager who never understood the implications of her statement. During the grueling two hours, while the sobbing teenager insists on her innocence, the officers lie about having medical evidence that proves she smothered her son. They also repeatedly accuse her of having killed her brother, who died eight years earlier uh, of uh, sudden infant death syndrome. At one point, actually, there are, there are um, videos on YouTube of the interrogations, and it's really painful to watch. At one point, the police officer, there are two really burly guys, and she is a, a tiny young woman, more a child, actually, than a woman. And at one point, um, this officer says to her, so, what did your brother die of? And the girl says, of the sudden infant death syndrome. And the officer says, oh, I think it's rather the big sister syndrome. Needless to say, um, at one point she confesses to the crime she didn't commit. The officers bark and curse and threaten that they will make sure she is tried as an adult if she doesn't confess. They berate her mother as un unfit, and they promise they will help her and her brothers to get the social services they need to improve their lives, and that she would be treated as a juvenile if she only confessed. 
After assuring that they would help her and her brothers, she finally confesses to a crime she did not commit. Subsequently, she was tried as an adult for murder. Corey Beale um, is a case from Maryland. Corey Beale was 17 years old when his best friend Michael Harley was stabbed to death. When officers asked to speak to her son, Joanne Beale, the mother, went with him to the station because she knew he had difficulties processing language and expressing himself due to a learning disability. Under false pretenses, the officers separated her from her son. When she saw him again after several days, he was charged with murder. In a small windowless room, the teenager was aggressively questioned for three days, slammed against the wall, and threatened with execution. He was deprived of sleep and at times handcuffed to a wall and did not allow him to rest at all. Asked why he had confessed to a crime that he did not commit, Beale said that he would have done anything to, that, got out of that, to get out of that room. Michael Crow, a case from California. Michael Crow, together with two of his friends, was wrongfully accused of the murder of his 12-year-old sister, Stephanie. Michael was exposed to four interrogations that each lasted for several hours, spread over several days, and were conducted by a group of officers. The boy repeatedly expressed his deep desperation over the death of his sister and the fact that the police did not let him see his parent at such a time. The officers lied about evidence proving his guilt. They lied that they had found blood from his sister in his room. They concocted a story about the good Michael and the bad Michael and that he may have killed his sister and now just could not remember it. Michael eventually confessed, maintaining even during his confession that he was only saying what the officers expected him to say. Ninth Circuit Court Judge Thomas wrote in his opinion, one need only read the transcripts of the boys' interrogations or watch the videotapes to understand how thoroughly the defendant's conduct in this case shocks the conscience. Psychological torture is not an inept description. However, the officers were never held accountable for their conduct. The city eventually settled a civil suit for 7.25 million. That was last year. Um, an additional concern to civil rights practitioners are policies and practices in schools which leave children vulnerable to several human rights, uh, to severe human rights uh, violations. These practices and policies are usually implemented by school safety officers. In a case, um, AMD Jackson Public School Board of Trustees um, students as young as nine years old, some with known medical and mental conditions, are shackled and handcuffed to railings, poles, chairs, bus seat legs, and other fixed objects, and left unsupervised for up to six hours at a time. This form of punishment is doled out for minor offenses, such as violating school dress code. While restrained, students are often forced to eat their lunches and must beg school officials to release them to use the restroom. Needless to say, the cases referenced here do not represent an exhaustive compilation because there is no systematic collection of police torture cases. These examples represent the tip of the iceberg. Torture has no place in any justice system. Those who perpetrate crimes of torture need to be punished. Those who consider perpetrating acts of torture need to be deterred. I hope you will support this important litigation.
Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you very much.